All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, ladies. Thank you so much for attending the conference today, and thank you so much for coming to the session. Hope you're having a great time so far and look forward to an exciting session this afternoon. My name is Margaret Kelleher. I am a senior manager here at VMware in the Worldwide Partner Programs Organization. I was also a member of the Program Selection Committee for the conference today, so I'm delighted and honored to be able to introduce our speaker today, Rebecca Fitzhugh. Rebecca is an independent consulting architect, a published author, blogger, and technical evangelist. In a past life, she served five years in the United States Marine Corps. So please welcome Rebecca. So thank you so much. And Rebecca will have a presentation, but there will be plenty of time for question and answers at the end. So we look forward to an interactive session today. So take it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, so as mentioned... I'm Rebecca, so I'm going to be talking to you today about something that, to be perfectly honest, I've never really spoken a lot about. Um, and so when I told my friends, you know, I'm, I'm getting up in front of a group of people, and I'm going to talk about the Marine Corps. One of my friends went, you're in the Marine Corps? No. Um, but, and they were just like, really? Like, you don't even like to talk to, I don't know, I just never felt comfortable speaking about this. But it was an unusual experience, right, to be in the Marine Corps, and specifically to even be a woman in the Marine Corps. Um, so the Marine Corps uh, is 94% men. <sighs> it was so much fun. You have no idea. <laughs> it was, it was uh, I, I don't know. You know, and, and the, the, the funny thing is, is I've been thinking a lot about my time in the Marine Corps lately. Um, it's kind of starting in November and, and kind of culminating this week. Um, and, and that is because 10 years ago in November, I shipped to Paris Island. And I stood on these yellow footprints, and I went, oh, man, I made the biggest mistake. No. Uh, it, and I graduated from boot camp actually 10 years ago last week. Right? So it's kind of this weird timing that I'm here now speaking to you about this. So I've now been out of the Marine Corps for five years. So that means that I've been out of the Marine Corps as long as I was in the Marine Corps. So that's kind of a weird place for me to be because I feel so far removed from it at this point that it almost feels like, a weird nightmare or dream or this, this thing that doesn't feel tangible and real anymore, right? So I've been doing a lot of reflecting about that. So I have some things that I kind of want to cover with you uh, today that I learned from this period of reflection of the past few months and from that time period of my life, um, which was some of the best and some of the worst times um, of my life, right? So leadership... I think it's something that you're not born with it, okay? Nothing, I find many statements kind of abhorrent, but one of them is he or she is a natural born leader. Come on. They just woke up, popped out of the womb, and they're like, I'm a leader today. No, right? This is a skill that we learn. This is a skill that we learn sometimes from having great leaders that we work for. This is also sometimes a skill that we learn from having awful leaders, that we work for, but it's something that we learn and we need to be aware and we need to build on it, okay? So, it's a blank screen, right? I promise it's not. What I find unusual today is I'm speaking to a room full of women and this conversation actually came up at lunch. I don't know when the last time that's ever happened was. I don't think that has ever happened for me. Um, so the last time I was in a room full of this many women was when I was in boot camp training with all of these lovely human beings, right? So I know it's a very high resolution picture. Um, <laughs> so I, I actually was staring at this, trying to play like, where's Waldo? Like, where am I? Like, I, was, I, I couldn't find myself. But I think this is the last time that I actually was with, with this many women who were pursuing the same career path that I was, right? And for the record, that's me. Okay. <laughs> it, took, it took me a while. And in fact, I texted one of my friends. And I went, I see you. It's my, still one of my closest friends. I was like, where am I? And we had to sit there and compare the picture and try and find me. Um, so most of the time in the Marine Corps, my life looked a little bit more like this. This is part of my platoon that I led. That one's me. right? Uh, and, and still, I almost put in another picture of VMworld last year of me with my colleagues all men right is that familiar to all of you 
All right. So uh, I'd like to change that. Right. Uh, and I think you would too, or else you probably wouldn't be here right now. Is that a fair statement? Okay. So one of the things uh, that I've kind of realized, and because I'm guilty of it, is that women systemically underestimate themselves. Okay. I know I do. The reality is, is that we're not natural born leaders. Okay. This is something that we have to practice. This is something that we have to be aware of. We have to exercise it. Right? It's in the Marine Corps where they teach you about muscle memory. Right? So it's practicing like you're in combat always. Right? So from the minute you put a rifle in your hand, it's getting in the warrior stance, right? It's having your knees bent, right? It's, it's practicing having your hand. We need to do the same thing with leadership. Right? This is something that you have to practice. You have to get better at. And, it's be, and eventually it will become muscle memory. Right? You'll just naturally be attentive, right? You'll naturally be concerned about your subordinates. You'll naturally be doing these things without even realizing, oh, I'm a leader, right? So <clears throat> I think all of you in here can be leaders if you're not already, okay? So I have this quote, okay, that's going to be coming up, and it's how I feel about leadership. Now, the thing is, is I keep going back to this thing that we're not natural-born leaders, right? So from the moment you step on those yellow footprints in boot camp, you are preach to about leadership. You have to memorize these things over and over again, and you just say them out loud. And eventually, you just start to believe them, <laughs> right? It's like this mantra almost. So they start with teaching you 11 leadership principles. They say, these are the 11 principles that make a great leader, right? Then we have 14 leadership traits, right? And nobody is going to remember those, so we had to use an acronym, because there's an acronym for everything, the military and the government. So it's JJ did tie buckle. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense, right? I arranged that in the order for you, but that's how we'd have to memorize it. Okay? And, and, and it, these are just examples that we get taught and we have to memorize and we just say it over and over. What makes a great leader? Hey, I'm inspecting you right now. Explain to me the 14 leadership traits. And you have to just be able to say it, right? Because the more you say it, the more you think about it, the more you believe it and you become this, the sort of leader that you can be. And it's not, it doesn't just end here, right? You get promoted up the ranks. You become a non-commissioned officer. I had the privilege of becoming a sergeant by the time I got out of the Marine Corps. Um, so that's rank five out of nine. That's the best rank, okay? Because you are the top of the bottom, right? <laughs> because the next rank is staff sergeant, and then you become a staff NCO, and you become the bottom of the top. So you become like the errand boy. It's not fun. So I was the best rank in the Marine Corps, but that come, there's a lot of responsibility, right? You always watch the like, all the, the war movies, and you saw Hacksaw Ridge, right? All these things that came out. It's always, you always hear about the sergeants, right? So that there's a lot of weight that goes with that. So you go to sergeant's course. When you become a corporal, you go to corporal's course, which is the rank below sergeant. And what do we learn? We learn about leadership. Sure, you learn arbitrary. To me, it's arbitrary now because I'm not in the military. Things about like, forming up your troops, marching them, doing all these things. But the thing that they focus on the most is leadership. Hey, okay? It's taught. Every year, the Commandant of the Marine Corps publishes a reading list and says, Marines should read. By the way, we can read. Okay, that is something that we can do. Um, <laughs> and it's funny because they start with some of the Ender's Game. It's a kid's book. They tell you to read that in Marine Corps. Right? It's a great book. There's all kinds of things that you can learn from that. Right? I read it at 22. Right? Yeah. But it's... <laughs> but it's but it's considered a, a like a preteen type book, right? It's not. It's, not. it's very violent. Well, it's like reading um, <laughs> it's like reading to killing to kill a mockingbird. When you read that in school, you go, great, boo, you know, Boo Radley, scout, cute name, whatever. And then you read it again as you you know in your twenties, you're like, whoa, <laughs> that's about racism. I didn't know that. You know, um, so it, it's the same thing when you read something like Ender's Game as an adult. That will make you. Oh, it's strongly suggested. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot you can learn from it. That's just really cool. I do think it's like learn. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just like one example. I just figured everybody would know that one instead of me being like, so there's this book by this Marine Corps officer. You're like, you're not going to know that one. But you know, Ender's Game, and that's on the list, right? Now, all of this is because they realize that there's a difference between a leader and a person in a position of authority, right? Okay. So I don't want to be disparaging against the Marine Corps by any means, but because it's like this in every organization. If you just stick around long enough, you're going to get promoted. Okay? <laughs> if you just don't screw up that badly, you're going to get promoted. And eventually you're going to be in charge of people. 
that makes you a manager, that makes you a figure of authority, that doesn't necessarily make you a leader. There are people that you work for right now, you wouldn't follow. You wouldn't follow them anywhere. <laughs> but they're your boss, right? I mean, it's, call me out if I'm making this up, right? So what, what makes a leader? I don't know. I'm going to speculate for the rest of this time, okay? <laughs> I don't think, you know, I don't think there's any kind of scientific formula that just goes, okay, here we go. We put in all these qualities. You are now a leader, right? So during my time in the military, I mentioned I experienced good leaders and bad leaders, and I think that you can learn just as much from a bad leader as you can a good leader. I had a corporal when I was a lance corporal, so when I was a wee, a wee child, uh, he was always late, okay, always to shift. He would be the NCO running the shift, and he'd be 30 minutes late, an hour late. In the Marine Corps, if you were 15 minutes early, you're late, okay? And he would be even later, and I just remember being like, I would never do that to my Marines when I'm a corporal. I would never make them sit there and wait. And the worse, the shift before us couldn't leave until turnover was complete. So not only is he potentially screwing us over, he's now screwing over another group of Marines. Okay, I learned at that point, I'm never gonna be late. This morning I was here way too early, right? <laughs> way too early, I was like, do I just sit in the parking garage? I don't know, right? Um, I, I texted one of my friends who works at VMware and I said, just drove by Promenade where you work there's no cars in the parking lot. Do people not show up at 8 a.m.? I didn't know. Um, they don't. <laughs> That's what I learned. <laughs> so I have this quote on the board. I, 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 heard, I heard a Marine Corps general say this one time. He said, self-interest is the cost of leadership. Maybe I was young. Maybe I was naive. But I thought, no. No. Yes. Okay. I'm not saying you need to give up your whole life you know, in, in pursuit of service. But at a certain point, it's not about you. If you're the person in charge, it's not about you. It's about the people that are under you, right? So you exist for them. So at a certain point, you need to put your interests aside and focus on the people who work for you. Because when they succeed, you've succeeded, okay? So... I was recently talking to a friend who works for this, this consulting firm, and he was telling me all about the fun, horrible things that were happening, right? And he was like, these people are just driving me insane. And it basically came down to that they were putting themselves first, right? They were feeding the needs of themselves rather than the needs of their employees, okay? And that, that's, that, that's, that's, a, that's a problem because Leadership is not a burden, and that's what they were treating it as. Oh, I have to go in and approve all these expense reports. <sighs> How awful, right? I'm sorry that you have to, nobody wants to do expenses. Yeah, I don't want to do expenses. I have to go do those tomorrow when I get back home, right? Oh, I was in Palo Alto, why? I don't know. Um, they asked me to speak about something. Um, it's, leadership is not a burden, and if you think that leadership is a burden, then you should not be a leader, period. Leadership is your privilege, it is your privilege to serve those under you. And if you don't feel that way, you probably have uh, a lot of self-interest, okay? Now, again, I'm not saying you need to go and sacrifice everything, okay? There is a fine line, right? And that's something that I struggle with, right? Where sometimes I'm like, I just don't have time to deal with them, right? And then there's other times where uh, my boyfriend's going, hey, guess what? You've been on the phone all night with them. They need to figure it out themselves, right? So there's a fine line, right? And, and that's something that we all have to kind of practice and, and try and figure out where that line is. Now, who has read all of this fun stuff about Uber and all of their practices? Have we all read that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How many people in here feel safe right now at work to say something? That's great. That's what I want to see. But the reality is, is that if I, and I want to see people's hands go up, I'm not going to reverse the question, but if I were to reverse the question, I said, who doesn't feel safe at work to say, your idea is not good, or hey, this person is doing X, Y, and Z. I guarantee some of you in here would raise your hand. 
right? I'm not going to put you on the spot like that, though I could, but I'm not. That's a problem. A good leader makes you feel safe. Okay? And I don't mean from physical harm, right? Like that's part of it in the Marine Corps, but that's not part of it in the civilian world. But the, you, you, should, you should feel safe from anything external to you and your organization. Okay? So I always kind of think of it as like a circle. This is a little bit silly, I know. But you create this, it's the safety net, if you will. You create this circle of trust. And somewhere in here, there's a leader, or it's more than one leader, who's making everyone around them feel safe from something external. This could be something like competition. Okay. Oof. There's all kinds of FUD and awful things that competitors do, right? Uh, you need to feel safe that your job's not going to be gone tomorrow, right? Or, hey, I just absorbed this company. We're going to lay everybody off, right? Okay, so we need to feel safe from competition. We need to feel safe when there's an, you know, an unstable economy. Okay, ah, things are bad. What do we do? We have to figure these things out, right? Or we're all in technology. What if a new technology comes out tomorrow and now renders your entire company obsolete? Okay, do you feel safe from that? Oh, nobody can. Nobody can. I agree. Right. Nobody can. And at a certain point, there, there's going to be sacrifices made. And I agree with you 100%. But you should have some kind of sense of safety that they're going to have your back when bad things happen. Right? That we're not just going to lay everybody off without taking care of you in the process. Right? Layoffs are sometimes inevitable. I was actually reading, side note, something about layoffs recently. I didn't realize, maybe, maybe you guys did, You're probably a lot smarter than me. I didn't realize that uh, layoffs weren't a thing until the 80s. So I was reading this, like, I don't know, this book. And it was talking why I was reading about layoffs on a Saturday night. I don't know. Okay, that's a conversation we can have later. But it was talking about that there really weren't mass layoffs until air traffic controllers in the 1980s during Reagan's administration protested. They boycotted. Right? I didn't know this. And maybe I'm proliferating, uh, I can't talk, proliferating a lie, but this is something that I was reading in a, in a published book. Um, and so they, they did the strike. And so basically Reagan said, you know what? Forget it. And he moved air traffic control to, to military and government air, uh, ATC of people and fired everybody else. And that's when, when the government did it, he fired all of the, uh, staff and started using military air traffic control because of that strike. That's when companies went, oh, we can do this. And then that's kind of started some of the mass layoff thing. So that was inside note. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to say a bad word. Okay, I'm just going to warn you so we can like get the, the bleep ready. Okay. Um, when I would describe leadership to my Marines, we all have kind of potty mouths. I would say your job as a leader is to be an umbrella during a shit storm. Okay. When all these bad things are happening, your job is to try and deflect them as best as you can. Now, you're right. Nobody's perfect. There are going to be things, you know, the, the lovely statement of things, another bad word, roll downhill. Right? You can't always protect everybody all the time. But it's your duty. It's your job to try. Right? So <clears throat> how do we create this sense of safety? Right? Well, part of it is we just simply put them first. Okay? Again, it's moderation. Right? But we need to put them first. And so one of the things that I've noticed uh, across my time in the Marine Corps uh, and my time now as a civilian is that there's a couple of things that I've found that most of the leaders that I've worked for that I consider a good leader had. Right? So I did this crazy mathematical formula. I stayed up all night in Excel trying to calculate this. And there's seven characteristics that I found okay, across all of the leaders that I served under. So I'm going to take a few minutes and tell you about these traits. So the first one is be self-aware. And in my opinion, this is probably the hardest one. Okay, This is something that's extremely difficult to do. But you have strengths and you have weaknesses. So do I. I'm an introvert. This is not my comfort zone. Okay, I would much prefer to be in the office by myself with headphones on thinking about things and not in front of people talking. Okay. But I know there are people who I work with who love to get in front of people and talk. So guess what? I'll let them talk, right? And I'll give them the data because that's what I feel comfortable doing, right? It's, it's building this team 
which is one of the ones coming up, right? Create a collaborative environment, but it's understanding your strengths and your weaknesses and, and, and improving on them, okay? No one's perfect. I recently did something a few months ago uh, called the VMware Certified Design Expert, okay? Ugh, all right, so VCDX. And this is the, the, the top certification that you can get with VMware. It, it's kind of like getting a PhD in a way, but in virtualization, because you have to write this massive document, right? This design, this infrastructure design, you have to create all this supplemental documentation. All in all, mine is like four or 500 pages. And then you submit it. And then there's this period of time where they review it and they can say, nope, you stink, get out of here, right? Um, or they'll accept it. And if they accept it, you're that's the easiest part was writing all that documentation. <laughs> now you have to prepare and stand in front of a panel of three of your peers, right? These VCDXs and defend your design and explain why. Why did I do that? Why is that against, for example, best practice, right? But don't say best practice in that room. It's a bad word, okay? And, and I did this and it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And so one of the things that I did is I literally made a skills matrix what are the technical skills I'm good at? What are the technical skills I'm bad at? And I went, man, storage is just not my strong suit. Okay? And I studied and studied and studied storage. And I walk in the room, and on my panel was a gentleman who wrote literally the book on VMware storage. And I went, oh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Great. But I felt confident because I had recognized that that was a weakness for me. And so I tried to, to, to fix that weakness, right? Now, you can't fix every weakness, right? But I realized that it was a weakness, and I started studying, and I started improving that. Um, and I actually felt like that was one of my stronger parts of that presentation. The one thing I did feel very strong on, networking, I didn't do so great on, probably because I was busy ignoring that and studying storage. Right? But now I can go back, and I can realize that. Um, create you know, groups of people who, who complement each other's strengths and weaknesses. This is something that we would have to do a lot on shift, right? I, I, when I became a platoon sergeant in Okinawa, uh, one of my responsibilities was to create the schedule. <sighs> that is not the job you ever want, because then you've got 50 people coming up to you being like, I really need Thursday off, right? <laughs> like not everybody can have Thursday off. So, but I had to also consider the group of people. If all of you were my Marines, I had to go, okay, well, great. Who's good at what? Who's bad at what? How do I pair them together? I can't have my networking A team all on one shift, right? Because then what happens if there's a you know routing issue at 2 a.m. and they're not there, right? So this becomes something that's kind of difficult, right? So we have to do this to ourselves, but then we also have to do this for our subordinates, right? We have to be aware of what their strengths and their weaknesses are. I had a gunnery sergeant that I was uh, served under, and I think he did this very well. This is something that I tried to take from him. Something that I'm struggling with right now, and some of you may be also struggling with, is as you go up the food chain, you start to lose your technical skills. Right, is anybody else experiencing that? Great. I'm now managing people. I'm now you know, in this leadership position, but I'm not behind the keyboard all day. I'm not in the server. Uh, and you're like, no. <laughs> exactly. But the, it, it is, it's hard because it, I'm going, I have to still make decisions that affect them who are running this technology. How do I do that without understanding the technology, right? So it's a very big challenge that I'm facing, you're you know, potentially facing as well. I had this gunnery sergeant that I worked for and he had that same problem. He was at this part now where he was not technical, but he was directly responsible for everything in our data center and us. So when it came to getting training, when it came to implementing some kind of new technology, he, so he, the good thing was he realized, I don't know. And he would start pulling us into the room. Hey, Fitz, you, come here. Right? So I know you do a lot of encryption stuff. Da 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 da. What do you think? Right? He valued my opinion. And he would do that for everybody else. And so it, ga it, it goes back to that sense of trust. He trusted us to give him advice, even though he outranked us times four or five. Right? And then that. In turn, out, in turn made us trust him, that he was going to make a decision with our best interest in mind because he was able to recognize that he had this weakness, right? that he had lost his technical skills. On consulting projects, I tend to try and surround myself with people that I perceive to be a lot smarter than I am. Um, and I do the same thing with my friend circle. right? 
Um, my One of my best friends has a master's degree in publishing. It is the best thing ever. Because every time I write anything that's going to get published, I send it to her first. And she proofs it and sends me back notes and is like, it's awful. And then I rewrite it and send it to her. And then I send it to the publisher and they go, wow, this is really good. I'm like, thank you. Um, <laughs> and it's uh, it, it's all because of her, right? And that's me consciously going, okay, I, I write too fast. I think too fast. I, I, so I, I'm sometimes bad at organizing my thoughts. And she helps me organize my thoughts, right? That's invaluable. I told myself I wouldn't put any gifts or memes in there. I said, Rebecca, you have to be grown up and mature today, but I couldn't help it because that one made me laugh so hard, okay? So it's from the TV show community, if you watch it. Um, the, the, uh, if you had no self-awareness, I mean, I would know if I had no self-awareness, right? <laughs> this one's hard can, as well. All of them are hard. Leadership's not easy, okay? Let's be real. Continue to learn and grow. Have you seen my schedule? Have you seen your schedule recently? When do I have time to study? When do you have time to study? <laughs> Nobody has time. So how do I continue to, I've now identified I have a weakness. Great, how do I fix it? I can't just take off five days and go to a class, <laughs> right? Uh, how much time do I have at night? There's only 24 hours in a day and at some point I have to sleep, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll give up sleep. This is hard though. How do I continue? So for me personally, um, I schedule it. As silly as that sounds, if you look at my calendar, it's meeting, 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 on-site client visit, launch. But if you look in the morning, there's a time slot first thing in the morning that says study. Right? And then in the, eve in the evening, there's also a time slot that says st study. I have to schedule it. If it's not on my I live and die by my calendar. <laughs> if it's not on my calendar, it will not get done. Okay? That method may not work for you. Okay. But this is something that's important. Technology is changing all the time. We have to grow and change with it. We cannot get, st I have people who still talk about token ring. I'm like, what? Okay. That's archaic at this point, right? So we have to keep growing. We have to keep changing, right? Virtualization. It's a thing. But is our container is going to overtake it? Right? I don't know. So that's something that we have to kind of study. We have to figure out. We have to acknowledge. That's a great thing. Uh, you know, to be honest, I'm self-employed at this point. I've been a freelancer for five years, so I do have a stipend. It comes out of my own pocket. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so for me, it's... You're just gonna have to, to but you know, I have, um, I have a friend who works for this consulting firm in the Midwest, and his boss, uh, so this is not a company-wide thing, it's coming from his de specific department, they make them take at least two classes a year. So I do that yeah. for my team, but the other teams don't have to, they just have a budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend's boss, they, they make them, right? And so if it becomes November, he's going, hey, I don't want to name drop my friend, but hey, friend, like you haven't taking any classes, it's November, like, you, you need to do that. And he also, everybody can see each other's calendar, and he's always like, why don't you have study time on your calendar? <laughs> so he's, like, really big on this because, <sighs> yeah, absolutely, right? Um, it's okay to not know something. There are plenty of things I don't know. Who in here has ever had a boss or a leader or anybody in their life who clearly didn't know what they were talking about? but just kind of kept going with it, right? Oh, yeah, right? There's nothing wrong with saying I don't know. For some reason, people think saying I don't know is a sign of weakness or it is a weakness. I don't think so. I don't think any of you think it is. I would much rather my boss or my leader go, I, I don't know, but not just say I don't know. I want to hear them say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out, right? I'm going to find out for you, okay? Go find out. <laughs> I, I, I sometimes will teach classes, um, and one of the things I do is if a student asks a question that I don't know, I just go, I, I don't know. And one of the things I always do is I write it on the board, or I always have a notepad and I write it on the notepad because if I'm being honest with you, if I don't write it down, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to remember. I'm going to leave that day and be like, yeah, I'm out of work, right? So I, I have to make note of that. But we have to keep learning. We have to keep growing because what happens? 
when all of our subordinates are learning and growing, and they're evolving and they're changing, and we're not. Okay. So definitely need to. And on that note, mentorship. Before I hit next. Mentorship. So this is kind of one of those, I keep hearing different arguments about mentorship going back and forth. Um, in my opinion, mentorship and leadership are intertwined. If you're mentoring someone, whether you realize it or not, you're leading them. And if you are their leader, you're mentoring them. They're taking cues from you. They're taking, they're going, wait a minute, well, if Rebecca did that, it must be okay, right? It's very much intertwined. And if you don't feel like you have a mentor, get one, okay? The onus of mentorship is just as much on the mentee as it is the mentor, okay? We're all busy. I'm busy. You're busy. I'm not going to necessarily always think, hey, do you need help? Can I mentor you? I should, but I may not realize it, okay? I may not think I'm busy, right? I can't think of any stopping and mentoring somebody. So it's just as much on you to go, hey, I need help with something, right? Is it is for me to offer that help, okay? It's a two-way street, absolutely. Be decisive. <laughs> Rory Gilmore has nothing on me when it comes to to pros and con lists. I'll tell you that. I am, I am indecisive. I, it's not so much that I'm indecisive, I think, as much as, I think it goes back to me being an introvert. I sit there and I think about it for a really long time. I make a decision, but it just takes me a while to get there, right? Because I really have to make sure I have all the information, and that's, that just doesn't work sometimes, okay? In the Marine Corps, we're taught to use the 75-25 solution. Okay, has anybody heard of this? Okay. Something like that, right? So very close. So the 75% is gather as much information as you can, right? Ask the questions, get the data, do the research, right? But when you have about 75% of that information, make a decision, okay? That other 25% is made up of you, your experience, your intuition, right? Your whatever. That's going back to the leadership skills you have, right, and the experience that you have, and just make the decision, okay? There are very few decisions that you make in this world that you can't undo, okay? Who in here has gone down a road and been like, ooh, shouldn't have done that, and then switched gears, right? We can always go back, right, unless it's something really horrific that lands you in, like, federal pen you know, penitentiary or something. We can always, we can always go back, um, so, because the reality is, is that if we sit there and we wait too long, that opportunity might be gone, right? Does that ever happen to somebody? That happened to me a couple of years ago. I had a job offer, and I went, I don't know if I'm ready to get a real job. I right? a great offer. But I just was like, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Made my pro-con list. It was perfectly matched. I was like, Ugh, I don't know. And I just ended up waiting too long when I finally was like, you know what? I think I'm going to, and they're like, we already hired somebody. I'm like, oh, it's my fault. It's hundred percent my fault. Same thing had happened in combat. If I wait too long to make a decision, now my whole platoon is dead. Right. And that's where we go back to using that 75, 25 method. You need to make a decision. Okay. You need to make a decision. If it's not the right one, fix it. Okay. Problem solving. Oof. This one's hard. I, I think I've said that now for every single one of them, right? Mm -hmm. They're all hard, right? Uh, the Marine Corps is the smallest branch of service. At its largest, it was about 225,000. And that was during the peak time in Afghanistan. 225,000. There's over a million people in the Army as a comparison. Okay, so the Marine Corps is tiny. And the Marine Corps is actually a department of the Navy. So it's its own branch, but not really. Right? So we actually fall under the Department of Navy, which means all of our funding comes from the Navy. And they're bigger, and they've got massive battleships and warships and things that we don't have. So we constantly didn't have money. Right? We didn't have budget. That became very challenging. And so with this, this kind of Spartan lifestyle that we lived, it taught us to be a little bit creative when it comes to solving problems, whether that was going and acquiring some gear, 
okay, from another uh, department? The Navy. I'm just going to take this off. Or when it came to how do we feed the Marines for Thanksgiving? Right? We don't want them to eat at the chow hall. How, do we, how are we going to do this? Right? We would always really come up with some kind of creative solution. And that's really important here as well. We can go read all these books. We can go you know, study all these white papers and things for technology. But sometimes it takes somebody going, this might sound crazy, but what if we tried this? Okay. Now, that's not just on you, though. That's on your team as well. Those are on your subordinates. We have to have that sense of trust built in where they feel comfortable enough to suggest something. Right? And this is something that I always tried to push with my Marines. And that comes back to this one. Right? The next one, creating a collaborative environment. How do, I can't make you work together. Right? It, it, you know, that idea that I gave you a minute ago was like the circle of trust. The problem with trust and the problem with collaboration, these are not things that I can tell you to do. I cannot tell you two to trust each other. Right? I cannot tell you to collaborate. It's a feeling. Right? And I can't make you feel things. I can't make you want to feel things. So what do I do? For me, who's heard the, my door's always open. My door's always open if you need to come talk. Who's ever taken advantage of that? Me neither. Right? So uh, when I got promoted as a sergeant, I took over uh, this this basically a whole data center. Um, and I became now the sergeant in charge of everything. And I was terrified. Right? So what did I do? I did like some of the leaders that I had. I went, my door's always open if you need anything. If you have any ideas, you can, come, you can come tell me. Guess how many Marines came to tell me anything? None. Because guess what? In the Marine Corps, I hold their whole life in my hand. If they do something bad enough, I can send them to prison. Right? the brig. I have that power. But that's also more of a responsibility in my mind, because now I'm not just responsible for them at work. I'm responsible for them outside of work. I'm responsible not only for them, but their family, their wives, their children, their husbands, right? That's a lot. So me going, hey, my door's always open. Nobody came. Nobody came. <clears throat> so in all hands meetings, I started going, does anybody have any ideas? So we have this problem. <clears throat> Can you help me solve it? How many people raise their hand? None, because I'm the sergeant. They're not going to contradict the sergeant. Um, so it ranged. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm like I'm getting choked up about this. Very emotional. Um, <clears throat> so it ranged. So uh, my first kind of leadership role in the Marine Corps, everything is, happens in threes. So at one point I was a fire team leader, which is the smallest, right, that you can go. And so it's three to one. So three fire team members to one fire team leader, right? And then you become like a squad leader, and then it's three fire teams, right? And then platoons, three squads, right? Um, on a normal day. My platoon, however, was not this perfect three to one. Um, so when I was platoon sergeant in Okinawa, I had about 45 Marines under me. Lay for death. I don't need that, I don't want that kind of response. But, I did it, right? And it was ter Every single day I woke up going, am I messing up their whole lives? <laughs> um, am I ruining everything? Because it goes back to we systemically underestimate ourselves. I know I, I, know I do, right? And I know I do it. So what I started doing in all hands meetings, and it worked for them because I, I like to kind of keep things relaxed, right? There's a time and a place for everything. Obviously, if the boss is a guy is watching you, you need to stand up when you talk to me, you have to go to pray, right? Well, if, but I want you to feel comfortable with me. Because I need you to trust me, and I need to trust you. So what I started doing, I don't want any, I never want anybody to mistake that I'm a super serious person. Okay? I like to take things kind of, you know, relaxed approach. That doesn't work so well in the Marine Corps. Right? Customs and courtesies and all. But I tried it as much as I could because the reality is, is that most of my Marines are going to end up just like me. And that's getting out after four or five years. So, I'm not telling them to go question leadership. That's not what I'm trying to tell them to do, but I'm telling, I'm trying to teach them to think for themselves, to collaborate, to work together, right? And sometimes that's them going, hey, I see your idea has this little flaw. Here's what I think could help improve it. And they might get told to shut up, 
right? But they need to feel like they can contribute to the team. And so I started in all hands meetings going and giving the worst ideas possible just to kind of joke around and see if anybody would be like, wait a minute, that doesn't, I remember one time we were having some kind of issue and I went, oh, you know, I have a great solution. How about we just delete all the four DNS lookup zones? And I had this, Lance Corporal just look at me with like terror in his eyes, just like, and, and I was like, sound good? Nobody said anything, right? So I'm like, okay, well, we'll just delete the four lookup zones, right? Just all of them. And he just kept, I, th I was waiting for, I thought he was going to faint or something. And I was just like, I was like, say it something, say it, say it. And then finally I went, hey, do you have a better idea? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, well, why didn't you say anything? You were just going to let me delete all the forward lookup zones? He's like, well, you're the sergeant. You're like, I am the sergeant, but I'm not always right. And I don't always have all the answers. And I need your help to make the decisions. I need that information from you, and you need to feel comfortable giving it to me. Now, there may be times where I tell you, shut up, know your place. Right, But there's a time and a place for everything. And there should be in all hands meetings and these sessions where we're going, what's going to work? What's not going to work? That you need to feel comfortable to stand up and say something. Right. So eventually they got the hang of it. It took a while because I was filling some very big shoes. The platoon sergeant before me was very well loved, but he was more of an authoritarian than I am. I was more of a, I'm going to make the decision, but what do you think? Right Now I might be like, mm, I don't agree with you, but I still want to know what you think. And I want you to feel comfortable enough with me to to tell me if I'm wrong, right? Because there are going to be times where I am wrong and I need to be self-aware enough that I can hear you say I'm wrong and then fix it, right? Empower them and they'll empower you, right? Everything is really a two-way street. Who's experienced failure? <sighs> Did anybody ever tell you it was okay? <sighs> It's okay, <laughs> let me be the first one to tell you. I never, this is gonna sound so awful, it's gonna sound very full of myself for saying, I never failed anything in my life, ever. I was the nerd, I was the all-A student. I was the middle child, so it was perfect, right? Because I could just do all these great things and no one would notice, and I could live my introverted life while being an all-A student, and it was great. And I went into the Marine Corps, and I went, this isn't the most, Difficult thing I've done in my life. I can. So I kept getting promoted. I went. This is great. I got out of the Marine Corps, and I went and I took my first certification exam out of the military. And guess what? I failed. I was up all night at the data center the night before, working on a problem. And instead of just rescheduling it, I went. I'll just take the exam. I'll be good. And I, I failed it. And the worst part is, it's not like I bombed it. I just barely failed it. Right. I was devastated. <laughs> 23 years old, crying like a little, like, oh, I felt it. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I never felt like in my entire life, my parents never made me feel like this, my leaders never made me feel like this, I never felt like it was okay to fail and get back up. Never. And that was a really important lesson for me. I had someone who I consider a mentor Basically tell me, and this isn't going to be the right answer for everybody. You need to know your subordinates, right? Because not every approach is going to work for everybody. But he basically told me, shut up. Just shut up. Just figure out where you went wrong. Go study that and take it again. I was like, tell me, shut up, right? But that's what I needed to hear. I am I'm very much need the tough love. I need him to be like, you're being a child, right? You're, ah, or whatever, some kind of remark to make me go, no, I'm not, and then go do it, right? That's what I needed. Now, that's not going to work for everybody. You can't go tell somebody, hey, guess what? Suck it up, right? But you might just need to sit down with them and go, okay, it's okay. It's okay that you failed. Uh, we live in this crazy high-tech world. We're on Twitter. We're on Slack. We're on all these things. We're always instant messaging each other. Sometimes it takes that human conduct, you know, contact to call somebody, pick up the phone, and actually, I know, I get really mad when I text my sister and then she calls me. I know, right? But sometimes we need to pick up the phone and just say, it's okay. Or go walk to them. Get out of your cubicle for a second and go, hey, I heard about your failure. Like, let me know if you need any help, right? Human contact will go a long way. It's okay to fail. I told you I did that VCDX thing, right? I got this crazy number, this wonderful certification. I failed it the first time. And this isn't like a VCP where I go into like the, you know, the Pearson View Test Center and I take the exam and I leave. This is a public failure. This is everyone 
and the community knew I failed. <sighs> that was the best thing that could have happened, honestly. Because when I failed, I went back and I reevaluated. Okay, where did I go wrong? How did I explain that? Oh, you know what? I focused way too much on the physical architecture. I really needed to be more logical. Whatever it was, right? I sat down, I did this really hard self-evaluation, and I went back in there the second time, and I stood in front of the guy who wrote the storage book, and I went, ugh, and I passed, okay? But I can tell you why I passed. I can tell you exactly, exactly what I did differently that made me successful the second time. Could I have said that if I had passed the first time? If you would ask me, hey, Rebecca, do you have any advice for VCDX? I'd be like, I don't know. I just kind of, I'm just awesome. I went in there and passed. I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what it was. It's okay to fail, and you're going to fail as a leader. And if your subordinates trust you because you've built that circle of trust, then they're going to empower you to get back up and do it again, just like you should do if they fail, right? Think of all the great innovators. They've all failed. Right? And I know there's that whole failure in Silicon Valley. I'm not saying failure is the best thing in the world. It sucks. It hurts. It doesn't. It's the worst. But you can learn a lot from it if you just think about it. Right? You, you, you evaluate what you did wrong, what you could have done better. Because not to sound cliche, because I'm about to sound cliche, it's not a failure until you give up. If I had not gone back and gotten my VCP, I would have never done the VCDX. And if I hadn't failed the VCDX... I wouldn't have learned. If, if, honestly, failing the VCDX made me a better architect. I probably couldn't be. I probably couldn't tell you that if I passed the first time. <sighs> Sense of humor. It's the last one. Okay. This is probably the easiest one to do. Right? Make a little joke. Right. I had that fun uh, community gif earlier. Right. Uh, I, I don't know. It's. There's something about not taking yourself too terribly seriously that makes other people feel comfortable with you. Right? If you can go into an otherwise tense meeting and just crack like a little joke, it puts everybody at ease. Right? First time I had to get up and make public do public speaking, I was terrified. <laughs> just like I was today. First thing I did is the first time I had a microphone. I was like, oh, I feel like Beyonce. Nobody laughed. They just stared at me. I probably should have read the room. It was a tech conference, and it was all men. And, um, <laughs> but you know what? I made the joke, and it made me feel better. And once I was like, ha Beyonce, oh, that didn't go well. Let's just go right into it. I felt more comfortable, right? It just it helps. It makes you more approachable, right? If you can have a sense of humor, it makes things just go a lot easier, right? I was stationed in Okinawa in 2011. It was right before I got out. Does anybody remember what happened in February, March time frame in 2011 in Japan? Earthquake. There was a big earthquake, right? And then there was a big devastating tsunami. tsunami. I was there. We called it Operation Tamagotchi, which I thought was hilarious because it sounded like Tamagotchi to me, which is like the little handheld game in the 90s. So I was like, Tamagotchi? Like, I'm going to kill my pet, you know. But um, <laughs> it was the worst. It was awful. Obviously, the, it was devastating, right, to, to def, different prefectures in Japan. But it was it sucked from a work perspective because we're support, we're communications, I right? work in Signal Intel, we're providing all the systems for those relief efforts. So we already work normally 12 hours a day, but we went from working 12 hours a day to 18, 19 hours a day, seven days a week, for two and a half months. I was in charge of the comm, like the little, the comm uh, for, the, for the Marine Corps Expeditionary Force. Right? I was in, in charge of this knock. So I slept even less than my Marines. And it was miserable. But it was like, it, it was as if it was my unit's credo to, to just have fun with it, right? To make the best out of the circumstances. So it was just all jokes all the time. Now, obviously, we took it very seriously. We're providing support for humanitarian aid, we're providing communications, but something went wrong, be like, well, everything's down again, great, you know, make jokes, make each other laugh. Still to this day, one of my friends will look at me and go, spam, talking about the food, not the email, and I go, Bleh. and it was just this dumb joke, because we were slap happy at three in the morning, having not slept all day, and he just said something about spam, and I was like, ugh, right? 
And to this day, he will still go, hey, Rebecca, spam. And I'm like, what? Right? It's just this stupid joke that brought us together. Right? It made our team feel like we were part of something. Even though it was serious, it made it feel like those long hours and the awful conditions weren't so bad. Right? So you have my permission. Go ahead and send that meme to your coworker. Okay? Um, so I want to leave you with one thought. In the Marine Corps, it's a tradition for the most senior person to eat last. Okay? We would eat in order of rank, from bottom to top. And when I was an NCO, you know, we would send the, you know, the privates to eat, the private first classes, the lance corporals, the corporals, and then the sergeants would go, and we didn't care about the staff NCOs, right? And we would take care of our Marines. And I remember hearing my fellow corporals and sergeants complaining because it was not a Marine Corps order. There was no regulation that said the subordinates must eat first. It's just something we did. And I would complain, oh, the food's gonna be cold by the time we get there. Oh, worse, there might not be any food. And for me, it always made sense. It sucked <laughs> eating cold food, but it made sense because it was a simple act of selflessness that made my Marines trust that even though right now it's about food and eating lunch, that if stuff hit the fan, I would take care of them. Right? Just by me eating last. It goes back to trust. Okay? So leadership, it's a choice. Okay? It is not a burden. It is your privilege. Okay? So I'd like us all to try and be the leaders that we wish we had. Okay? We're going to fail at some point. We just get back up and we'll keep trying. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Everybody give me a give her a warm thank you. So we do have time for some questions. If anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and raise your hand. I'd like to give you the mic so that we can record it and so that people on the video can hear it. So any questions from anybody in the audience? Thoughts? Good, get out. <laughs> I have, oh, there's one right here. Go ahead. Dun, dun, dun. I knew it was going to be you. <laughs> <laughs> My question is about uh, how you deal with um, team members who are just resisting change, resisting your whatever you are proposing, being friendly or being involved in taking decisions or anything. Like, they have their own agenda, and they're going to stick to it. So what do you do? The Marine Corps answer in me was, haze them. No, um, that was a joke. Promise. Okay. Uh, that, that one's a very difficult, it's a very difficult situation, right? There's always the one person, that, that guy, right, or that girl that doesn't want to play with the team. It's not your job. I know I, like, thought I'm relaxed, and I like to be relaxed. I am, right? And I try and have a friendly kind of cohesive, collaborative environment. But at the end of the day, as a leader, it's like being a parent, okay? If you're a parent, you want your child to succeed, right? You want your child to be better than you could have ever dreamed you could be. But how do you do that? You give them education, right? You discipline them, right? I'm not saying go if you can, right? But you, you come down and say, guess what? No iPad for you, right? That's the worst thing you can do right now for my 10-year-old niece's take away her iPad, right? No iPad. But this is the same thing, right, in an organization. You're going to have to find a way to discipline them, right? It's not just positive, it's not just positive right? It's negative, too. Um, because that's your job as a leader, right? It's to be that support system, just like a parent is. And it's just impor it's important for you to say, good job, as it is for you to go, that's not okay, come here. Now, I strongly believe in... Disciplining in private. In the Marine Corps, it's all about mass punishment. Oh, you screwed up? Everyone's going to suffer. I don't believe in that. Okay? I believe in praising in public and punishing in private. Okay? So for me, I would pull that person aside and go, like, you need to get on board or you need to get out. You know, not in so many words. That's pretty harsh. Obviously, you work up to that. Right? <laughs> you don't go, you're out. Um, <laughs> but you're going to have to discipline them. And right? that's going to be part of, unfort that, that's the not fun part. What you want to see is everybody succeed and go, great, awards for everybody. But there are going to be times where you have to go, mm-mm, mm-mm. Don't mistake kindness for weakness. Come here. Just because I've been nice doesn't mean I won't come down on you. Okay. 
Does that answer your question? Maybe. Yeah, it's a little hard. It is hard. Where it's hard to find people. It is. Where it's not encouraged. Imagine the Marine Corps, I can't fire them. They signed a contract, they're there. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult situation no matter what. But, yeah. Oh man, back row, representing, hey. Hi, my question is, um, if you have organically grown to become a leader or a people manager, how do you lead a team of your peers, people who have who you have worked with at the same level at some point of time, and now you're managing them, managing their careers, mentoring them. So how do you? So not everybody is going to be okay with it within your team. So how do you uh, lead them? The same thing happens in the Marine Corps, right? Where you and I today may be peers, and then tomorrow I get promoted, and then now you're in my squad or you're in my fire team. And that's a very difficult situation. Um, and so it, it's because it's, it's not hard just for them. It's also hard for you, right? It's hard for me to now be in a position of leadership or a position of authority and have to discipline somebody who yesterday was my best friend at work, right? I, you know, to be honest, I don't know if I have a good answer for that um, because that's something that I struggled with in my time in the military. And ultimately, my answer was not the right answer. Um, it was one of my failures as a leader, I think, um, where I tended to isolate myself a little bit more. Um, where I'd be like, well, I'm the sergeant, so sorry guys, I, I can't go to that promotion party. Right? Or I can't do that, because I was the one in charge. And that's not necessarily the right answer. Right? I, I would say that's one of my failures, was I pulled away a little bit too much. There were times I was too strict when I should have been kinder. And there were times where I was too kind when I should have been stricter. And I think that was one of the times where I was a little too strict. Um, but there's a separation between work and play. Right? And, and the reality is, is that never, not, not everybody can separate the two things. And I, I think we're always going to struggle with that. And I don't know if there's ever a right answer for that situation, to be honest. Yes. Um, so my manager and I were peers already had more experience than I did. Uh, then I did. Um, and uh, then he, he um, actually became my, uh, my manager. Um, and uh, I think what, um, I think one thing that worked is that you have to own that position. Yeah. You can't right. shy away you from it. Are, you are, um, and, and, and I, I, own, I owned the fact that he was now my boss. Yeah. And he was not prior to that. Right. And, uh, um, and for me, uh, as an employee, that was actually the first thing, right? The first thing that comes to mind is that, oh my God, you know, he, he knows how much I make now. He, he determines how much, right. you know, I, I can make in the future and all of that. The first thing you need to do is to accept that. And as once you're mature enough to do that, I think that helps employees a lot. But then as, as a leader, he, you know, immediately took on this sort of benevolent, right boss position and that's exactly where he needed to be he should not he did not apologize for for you know becoming my manager so i think that you can't is one, apologize yeah for that. exactly so you just have to take you know you you are in a position of authority and i think you have to own that if if uh, if you get promoted beyond your peers i agree it's wonderful thank you i mean i'll open that at anybody you know, don't don't I'm not strictly leading this conversation, uh, so anybody else, feel free to jump in. Because it's a women's conference, maybe this question needs to be asked. Did you have any specific challenges specific to your gender in the Marine Corps? Oh. Any, anything you can <laughs> come with us? Um, yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> it wasn't fun. Um, I was always the only one, oh. right? Um, in, in training, but once I got to, and so it was funny as you would notice as you would move along, there'd be less and less and less. So in boot camp, you train, you do all the same things as the men, but separately, right? Separate, but equal. It was mostly a, uh, hygiene type stuff, right? Because there are times where, um, like they weigh you frequently and um, they inspect you for injury and stuff like that and you're completely naked the whole time um 
So it was kind of that. But then once you go to combat training, after those 13 weeks in boot camp, uh, it's integrated. Right? And so at that point, it's back, it's probably closer to the 90, 10% women. Um, they try to mix it a little bit better and hold some, make the platoon smaller. That way it's a little bit more equally dispersed. Uh, but then by the time you get to your first duty station, my first duty station, um, it was just me on the co- communication side of things. There was one other woman. She worked as, guess what? Special. Admin. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I, when I went to Okinawa, uh, there was other women obviously in Okinawa, but I was on this very, very small base and I was the only girl. And what I realized very quickly um, was I had to work a lot harder for their respect. That when my peer, who was also a sergeant, a man, would walk in the room and he'd go, hey, do this, they'd do it. And when I would walk in, I'd go, hey, do this, they'd be like, okay. <laughs> so there were very many, there were, there were a lot of times where I had to be the bitch, right? Where I had to be like, you're going to do it, or there's going to be re- repercussions. But the good thing that I found was um, I had a good relationship with the other people who were sergeants. I was the most senior one, so I was in charge of everybody, but I had other sergeants that were had my back. Um, and so if I was like, hey, you're going to do this, they would jump in. But it was a fun challenge. I once was in formation. I was holding the formation. And this Lance Corporal walked up to me and said, you're a sergeant? I'm like, <laughs> right? I was like, number one, you don't speak unless spoken to sort of thing, right? And when you talk to, it's a very weird lifestyle, right? When you talk to somebody who's higher ranking than you, you stand up and you go to parade rest, right? Or if you have a working relationship with them, you can do modified parade rest, right? This guy just walks up and he's like, you're a sergeant? I was like, yes, it's on my collar, right? And then he made a comment that I will never forget. He goes, you're not married or pregnant? Because that was the stigma of female Marines. In the Marine Corps, women, Marine, WM, if you got called a WM, they're calling you a walking mattress. So I found very quickly that if I would always have to do twice as much, I'd have to be twice as fast, twice as smart. And I hated it. <laughs> and I got out of the Marine Corps being like, it'll never be like that again. <laughs> I stayed in tech. Why did I do that? I don't know. And, and, and it's a challenge. And, and so for me, um, and this isn't right for everybody, right? I do think that we need to talk about these things. We do need to have conferences like this. We need to feel safe going, hey, things just aren't fair, right? Women make 70, what is it, 77 cents to the dollar, right? Or 78 cents. We need to say something, right? I mean, but there's a time and a place. And that was something that I learned in the Marine Corps, that there was never a time and a place. So I just shut up, and I did my job, and I tried to do it better than every man in the room. But that doesn't work in tech, right? Because that's what we've been doing, right? That's what we've been doing for decades. We've been great, right? I mean, hidden figures. We always went to see that. Like, come on, she was the best, right? So it's something that... I, I think I'm not the only one facing. Did you have to work harder also to promote yourself to the higher-ups? Yeah. Um, in my perspective, um, I, this, this gentleman got promoted before I did because we would get something called pro-con marks, which were proficiency in conduct. I had a higher physical fitness score. I had a, a higher rifle score. I had more education done than he did which is part of your proficiency. I was, um, this guy, uh, he wasn't dumb. I don't want to be disparaging, but he wasn't naturally quick learning. Right? He didn't learn very quickly. So um, I learned and I would adapt quicker than him. And I noticed, because everybody talks, right? there's no secrets, that he got 4-6, four, 4-6. Six, four, six. A perfect score is 5. Nobody gets 5s, ever. right? Because nobody can be chesty puller. It was like this icon in the Marine Corps. I got four, two, four, three. And I was better than him. We'd, in every way. And, um, something I found out later, um, when I befriended somebody who was higher ranking than me for a long time, is they had actually submitted me for higher pro con marks than this gentleman. But they have to get 
approved up the chain of command. So my immediate chain of command approved it. They're like, yeah, Corporal Fitzhugh's great. Corporal Fitzhugh, whatever. Approved it. Got up to the, the highest ranking enlisted person in my unit, who's a master gunnery sergeant, and he's the one who knocked it down. And it turns out it's because he believed that women did not belong in the military. That was his belief. So I was being punished because of my gender. But it also, I don't have the power to change that in the military. Right? I can't go and be like, hey, that's not cool. Oh, great. I've been insubordinate. Now you're going to take all my pay away from me. Right? Um, so yeah, absolutely. There was things that, I mean, and the solution was always to shut up and be better. And that's not the right solution. So that's something that we all have to figure out. Um, I mean, look at senior leadership. How many are women? Right? They talk about hiring bias. I don't think there are many men in the tech industry. There are some who are terrible, right? Misogynist, whatever. But I don't believe most men in the technology industry purposely don't hire women. We hire people that are like us. <laughs> We're not like them. Okay, so they're going to be like, oh, but what if I make some joke that is offensive, right? Or, oh, what if, right? So how do we solve this? Well, we have to be leaders, too, right? We're going to have to do the dirty work, slowly get promoted up the food chain where we can make a difference, right? Um, even, like, VMware has a great company. Like, they're, they're all about diversity and inclusion and all these wonderful things, and that's wonderful. But still, when you look at their senior leadership, you've got people like Robin Matlock. That's wonderful. You've got Yan Bing Lee. Right? Um, wonderful. There's still not enough. Right? So it's going to be us having to, 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 to set the example, to take that leadership role on in order for us to start solving some of these systemic issues. That was very long winded. I feel like I got on a soapbox there. I apologize. Oh <laughs> Nancy, can I just ask you, will you be able to stay for a few minutes? Absolutely. Yeah. Just, I'll be respectful of the time because it's 208. Oop. So I'll take the yeah. mic back. So I just want to say thank you again for coming today to the conference, to the session. Let's give it up for Rebecca again. Thank you.